Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth on Now You Know. All right, Jesse, 140 slides, a four hour plus presentation. Look, we're going to shoot for about 30 minutes here. So you can go watch the four hours of that if you want to, or you can stay with us. Now, did Elon announce a next gen vehicle? Uh, did he announce something to do with Cybertruck? Uh, did he announce RoboTaxi? Kinda? Did they show where Magic Doc was opening? Uh, and did they announce another Gigafactory location? Yes. All right, we'll tell you about it next on In Depth. Thank you to Blinkist for sponsoring today's episode. Zach and I are super busy between researching, writing, corresponding, interviewing, filming. You get it. For most of us, there just aren't enough hours in a day to get things done and fill your brain with everything that you're curious about. I love podcasts and books, but unfortunately, they take a long time to digest. That's why we both use Blinkist. Now, with Blinkist, you get the key ideas from nonfiction bestsellers in minutes, not hours. Blinkist not only blinks books, but it also blinks podcasts. They're called shortcasts, so you can get to the powerful ideas of a podcast in about 15 minutes or less. We're currently blinking Ready for Anything by David Allen. It's a title I think just about anyone would enjoy. Ready for Anything is honestly one of those books that I knew I'd enjoy, but I also knew that I didn't have time for. Yeah, that's definitely my problem. <laughs> there are so many great books and just so little time. Yeah, for me, getting through a few pages a night before I fall asleep means that I don't remember the beginning of the book by the time I get to the end of it. Pop Blinkist on your phone and take it anywhere you want to go. And we've been using the new feature, Blinkist Connect. It allows every premium Blinkist plan to be shared by two different accounts. It's no additional cost to you, and it's free to the person you invite for as long as you're sharing it with them. It's a great way to connect with friends and family, to share and talk over the books and podcasts that you're enjoying. With over 5,000 books and podcasts to choose from, if you're like me, you're going to get addicted. So sign up for Blinkist now using our link below and get 25% off Blinkist Premium and enjoy two memberships for the price of one. Start your seven-day trial by clicking here. Thank you to Blinkist for sponsoring this episode. All right, so because we have so many slides, we're going to get through this as quickly as possible, just stopping on the things we think are important. Now, it was a very important investor day, but it wasn't like what I think you might have been thinking it would be like, especially if you'd seen all the pre-media, which was like, they're going to announce the RoboTaxi yes. network and all this stuff. That is not what happened. This is not an announcement uh, bonanza like I think a lot of people were expecting. This was, well, I think that uh, Zachary Kirkhorn actually said it best at the beginning. They talked about three different things. The macro, what does it take to convert Earth to sustainable energy? Number two, Tesla's contribution to that need and going through all the different leadership teams of the company. And then third, what does this mean for Tesla as a whole? And this was a very, very long term and also explainy sort of presentation. That's why it was four hours long. And uh, we're going to kind of go through it as quickly as we can. So this is obviously master plan part three, and Elon said there'll be a white paper coming. Uh, they're going to have a clear path to fully sustainable civilization with abundance. And that's the key point here is a lot of people, I think, thought that like when you're earthy crunchy, that meant that you're going to do without. And Elon said, no, we have a path here where everyone can have what they want and we can all do it sustainably. And he said, it's amazing how few people realize this. Even most smart people that I know don't see this clear path. So here's what he's showing is going on today. Our energy economy is dirty and wasteful. So first of all, we don't need to be using as much energy as we currently do. And by using, uh, mostly we're talking about the burning of fossil fuels. Burning something isn't the most efficient way to get anything. Um, if you've learned thermodynamics, you'll know that. So having it all stored and used as electrical energy is going to make things a heck of a lot more sustainable. And that's what they talked about in their very second slide. Right. And so the key point here is that if we go to electrification, we'll use probably about half the amount of energy that we need using fossil fuels today. Now, a vast amount of battery storage is needed, 240 terawatt hours, or that is 240,000 gigawatt hours of EV and stationary storage. We'll need 30 terawatts of renewable power, and the manufacturing investment is $10 trillion, although Elon said maybe we could do it for six. But the key point here is that the world economy is about $100 trillion, so this would be 1% of the world economy over 10 years. So not that big. And so a lot of people say, well, that's going to mean so many raw materials. You'll never be able to take them all out of the ground. And what they're showing here is that it's actually going to mine less ore for this new economy. All right. So here's the plan to eliminate fossil fuels. So first of all, switching to renewable power in the existing grid. Then switching to electric vehicles. Then switching to heat pumps. Then high temperature heat delivery and hydrogen. And then finally, sustainable fuels for planes and boats. And basically, they said that all transportation, except rockets, although including rockets, will go electric eventually. 
And it's not that far fetched to be thinking about this because 60 percent of the energy added to the grid in 2022 was solar. Um, so that should tell you a little bit of something of how the trends are already going. Um, so we're just gonna, basically going to be continuing that and Tesla's going to be speeding that up. Going to the switch to electric vehicles, about 10 percent market share now is EVs. And Elon said this will be like, you know, when we switch from horses to cars or from flip phones to smartphones, you'll just you won't even think about why you ever used a gas car before. And speaking of the global electric fleet, uh, do you spot something weird looking under that uh, curtain there? So obviously there's the robo taxi or the next gen vehicle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that weird looking one. Looks like a van to me. Tesla van? Tesla van. Nice. Van life. And then an interesting slide here, obviously the Tesla Model 3 is way more efficient than the Toyota Corolla, but um, Drew Baglino said that a Model 3 can drive over a mile on the energy it takes to boil water for pasta, and then another mile for the energy it takes to cook the pasta. Cool way to think about it, yeah. how efficient they are. They mentioned the switch for heat pumps in homes, businesses, and industry. So basically every form of heating a space should be using heat pumps, according to Tesla. And remember, heat pumps move heat, they don't create it. I feel like that's a public service announcement. And that's why they're able to be vastly more efficient than a heater that has to create the heat. And then, of course, 17 percent reduction in fossil fuel use when we electrify high temperature heat delivery and hydrogen. This is for things like factories and stuff that need a lot of heat. Right. Creating steel, cement, stuff like that. And then 120 million tons of hydrogen comes from fossil fuels today. And Elon said there'll be no hydrogen in transportation, but we will, I guess, use some hydrogen for electrifying high temperature heating and delivery. So green hydrogen specifically. And lastly, sustainable fuel for planes and boats. And that's only 5% of what we'll need. But um, Elon did say that LFP batteries would work in ships right now. Yeah. So that's fun. He also talked about, you know, if you could make a plane out of the structure being batteries, then you could make a plane, uh, an electric plane happen a lot sooner. And he said that uh, 450 watt hours per kilogram density will work for planes right now. And we have batteries that do that. All right. So if we stack up the investments in our sustainable future, this is what we get. So 30 terawatts of solar and wind farms, 240 terawatt hours of vehicle and stationary batteries, and $10 trillion in manufacturing capex. And as you can see there, one of the biggest costs is going to be the switch to EVs. Yep. That's why we talk about it on this show. And so if we grow our production capacity as shown by 2030, we can be 100% sustainable by 2050. There's the plan. Hmm. It's only a 3x more needed in solar deployment, only 11x more needed in EVs. I mean, it's not that hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this sounds expensive. And why does Tesla want to waste everybody's money? $10 trillion is so much money. Well, actually, that's 60% of what we invested last year in fossil fuel infrastructure. So we're already spending it. Um, and just by the way, since 2016, there has been a 65% Kager growth in Tesla energy storage business. I just want to point that out. And more than enough renewable resources available, and this shows on Earth the amount of space we would need, 0.2% is what we need. And that could be used in desert regions. And just to give you some idea of what that means, right now we use 12.5% of our land for farming. And so this is just a tiny little, like you can see there, a dot that we need. And of course, whenever you start to talk about batteries and stuff like that, people go, well, you need to mine it. There's all sorts of mining you have to do. Well, they talk about that, too. A sustainable energy economy involves less mineral extraction. Right. So this is what we need right now. And that's 68 gigatons of minerals. And this is what we would need for a sustainable energy economy. And that would be 54 gigatons. So, so less mineral extraction. Once you stop extracting all the minerals that you need to burn in order to keep everything running, uh, then you actually don't need to mine that much at all. And these are the minerals that we'll need. And it's mainly nickel and lithium, as you can see there. So this is cumulative demand until 2050. So it's actually not that much more in terms of materials that we need. And this is what Drew Baglino pointed out. The graph on the left shows what people think happens. And then this is what actually happens on the right. So people think we're running out. Mm. And actually, the more you look for something, the more you find. Oh, and as Elon pointed out, um, the limiting factor here is not finding the minerals, it's refining them. And you might be wondering why mining was so low. Well, it's because once you mine it, you never have to mine it again. It's just going to get recycled. He said, look, we're here to talk more about uh, you as an investor in Earth. And he wants everyone to be hopeful and optimistic, not wishful thinking, but Earth will move to a sustainable economy in your lifetime, he said. So then we moved on to Lars and Hans. I'm Hans. I'm Franz. And we want to pop you up. They're heads of engineering. And uh, they approached the Model 3 differently than the Model S. They were talking about in the old days how they just basically was like they're building an airplane while they're flying it. They didn't know what the hell they were doing. And then they talked about how the Model 3 was designed differently, but that that led to the Model 3 production hell. 
and how they've basically been learning over the years that now they put all the people in the same room, all the designers, engineers, the manufacturing, the automation together so that they can all figure stuff out. And it's led to a very efficient process and the factory footprints have gotten smaller and it's just one org. They can all just get an answer very quickly. So they talked about how the current way that we make vehicles is the same as it was in 1922 when Ford started, right? You stamp, you body, you paint, you final assemble. And they showed this great animation of how a Model Y gets put together, all of the different steps where you put the doors on it and you paint it, you take the doors off, and then you put all sorts of different stuff in. And it really it takes a long time because you're doing it in this 1922 version of building a car. They are developing a completely different strategy of how they put a car together. And a lot of this is based around smaller sections. Instead of having a whole car move down a line, which means that you need something that can move tons of material in this big car and people need to walk all around it, they're going to be putting together smaller modules and then bolting those together. Yeah, they've already come up with ways to make step changes in cost, including the giga castings, deleting hundreds of parts, the structural battery. They've reduced assembly lines by about 10%, and they're working on what Lars calls the space-time efficiency. And so now, instead of building the whole car together, they're going to basically make these different pieces, put it all together in this order. Yeah, it's a parallel and serial assembly. So it is completely different than any car has pretty much ever been made in mass production. And that leads to this orders of magnitude change in terms of faster, less capex and a reduced cost by as much as 50 percent. 50 percent reduction in cost. OK. Now, they said that this is going to be how they make the next generation car, which they can't unveil today. today. So that's unfortunately we didn't get a peek at what it would look like. But it's more about how they're going to make it, in my mind, than how, what it's going to look like. I think we're so excited about models and stuff. And I think in this case, it's just going to be probably a Model Y and a Model 3, but just made a lot cheaper. Next up was Colin Campbell, and he talked about the amazing efficiency in powertrain, not just how the car moves, but also how they make the powertrain. This is what I loved about Investor Day, getting to meet these players that we don't normally get to meet, talking about parts of the car that we just usually gloss over. This is like talking about the engine of a gas car. This is the powertrain of the electric car. And he was pointing out how efficient Teslas are already. But then he talked about how they were able to improve efficiency all without compromise in power. So as you can see here, they have a 20% lighter drive unit, 25% less rare earth materials, 75% smaller powertrain factory, and 65% cheaper powertrain factory from when they started producing the Model 3. And they did this all with having small teams. And he pointed out that in German companies, they use contractors to make these parts. So you don't even know what the how it works. The, the motors being made that are going into German hot luxury electric vehicles are made by third parties are not made by those German companies. Exactly. He said, we built the components and the factory that build those components. Then he went into some, something that none of us, I think, even think about, which is silicon carbide wafers. And he was saying that, take a look at this before you got four of these things. After you got one of these things, you might be like, well, who cares? Well, they can cut the cost and mass by half of the power electronics part. And if you don't know what that is, that's a microprocessor or a chip. Maybe you've heard of something called like a chip shortage. Mm. So it's good that they have less of those things in their vehicles now. And they're making them custom themselves. Um, and then here's another thing they've worked on. They've made custom software to simulate the magnetic field of the motors. Their own tools, Tesla's own software tools are faster and more accurate than the ones you can buy. And so they can go through millions of designs to find the best one very fast. And that lets them build the most efficient and most powerful motors and also the cheapest. Then he said, there'll be a 75% reduction in silicon carbide in the next gen vehicle. And the next gen vehicle's powertrain will be able to accept any battery chemistry. And basically, it'll be about a thousand dollar all in cost in a 50 percent smaller powertrain factory with the same capacity. I mean, wow, it's insane. And the next drive unit, he said, will use no rare earth minerals at all. And it's still going to be a permanent magnet. I don't know how <laughs> you do that. Next up was Peter Bannon and David Lau. They were talking about the electronic architecture. And uh, they were talking about how in the beginning, the Model S 2012 used 300 low voltage devices. So that light in your glove box, for example, that was one of them. And here's what the wire harness looked like. It was messy and had to be made by hand. Then going from Model S to Model 3, they were able to reduce the wire harness by 17 kilograms. And one of the ways they were able to do that is Lars said to his team, for every kilogram you reduce the weight, I'll give you a bottle of your favorite spirit. And so this graph is showing the percentage of Tesla design controllers. And so in Cybertruck, it's going to have 85% of their own design controllers. And in the next gen vehicle, it's going to be 100% Tesla designed. 
vertical integration. And it was interesting because the more controllers that Tesla makes themselves, the more control they have over the car itself. Mm. Even after they make the car, yeah. they are now able to make software that can play with their own controllers. Um, Sentry mode is a perfect example of something that didn't come with the car and they were able to make later. Then they talked about e-fuses, which allow for software controlled retries and monitoring. Um, and it's basically the software that controls the hardware. And because they're making the hardware so smart, they can make everything smarter. As you can see from the chart, electronic fuses are better. <laughs> so why aren't they in all cars? And then moving on, speaking of better, they talked about Moving from a lead acid battery to a lithium ion battery, it is an 87% reduction in mass and it should last for the entire life of the vehicle. Yeah, no more dead batteries again. Also, they mentioned they can use software validation after installation to make sure that it was installed properly. Here we go. Reduce costs of the Model 3 and Y center display. So this is that 15 inch center display. Look how much cheaper every year they've been able to get it. Oh, not just cheaper, also the weight and the power. But what's next? Well. We've had 12 volt batteries in cars for over 60 years, right? 200 amps of current having to run around the car, which means really thick wires. Well, what they're going to do with Cybertruck is a 48 volt architecture. And again, a reason why I liked Investor Day, we got some really cool information about what's going to come out in your Cybertruck. All right. So because of the laws of electricity, if you change the current by factor of four, you get a 16 times reduction in the loss of power. So you can have smaller wires, smaller e-fuses, smaller heat sinks, or maybe no heat sinks. And so you get a lot less stuff that you have to put in the car. This is the future, they think, of cars, 48 volts. And so you can see here that you can reduce the number of wires because they're going to have local controllers and they're going to use network packeting to transfer information between parts of the car instead of having to use wires to do it. For anyone who's had to rewire a car before. And here's the future of Tesla's low voltage. So the next gen vehicle will have it for sure, Cybertruck for sure. And they were saying that because they use software, They've been able to find things out about their users that they didn't even know themselves. For instance, they were able to monitor how often people use the sunroof and they found out that hardly anyone ever used it. And that's why you don't find sunroofs on the Model 3 and the Model Y, because they don't think it, people really want them. Not my most favorite example, but... No, I think it is. Because if you ask me if I want a sunroof, I'd I be go, like, of yeah, course I do. Yeah, but right. I have it on the Ford. I haven't used it once. It, oh, yeah. I forgot that I had that. <laughs> And then they're able to use data to simulate crashes whenever they make a change. So instead of having to go test it in real world or wait years for the data, they can simulate that. And in fact, they've been able to do that with seatbelt tensioning. They've reduced it with some of the updates because they found out that it hurts people less. And they're able to simulate it because they have actual crash data that the cars collect and send back to base. Yeah. Not many other car manufacturers do that. 123 million miles driven every day, 1.9 million charging sessions every day gives them tons of data so that they know what the cars are up to. This is kind of interesting. This is a really new thing. Uh, Tesla is going to be rolling out predictive air suspension. Mm. So they're going to use the fleet to determine the level of road roughness, and that's going to allow them to raise or lower the suspension of the car without you having to think about it, without you having to have ever been on that road before because somebody else had driven down the road and they're using all different parts of the car in order to know that. Yeah, and they've also been using it in things you don't even know about. They've been putting your car in shadow mode if you drive a Tesla so they can find out if the automatic emergency braking would work better or worse without you having to, without it having to happen to you. It's just they, in shadow mode, go, what if we had emergency brake right now? Oh, I found this really interesting. Um, in the early days of making the Model S, for example, when they plug something into the car, they had no way of knowing if that part worked or if it was even plugged in right. Now, as they're building the car in the factory, when a worker plugs something in, it immediately checks with the main computer to see, is this the right part? Was it plugged in correctly? Is it updated per correctly? Is it working correctly? And if not, they can tell a human and it can get fixed right there. Literally the center screen on your Tesla, the thing that tells you, oh, I should take a left. While they're building the car, it's telling them if they made a mistake while they're building the car. And it's communicating that to the factory itself. So that way somebody can say, stop, fix that before they put a seat cover over it. Then we had a whole thing about autopilot. It's super interesting, but I don't think we're going to get into it here since it's basically a rehash of autopilot day. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you're going to see some cool graphics and slides, but I think all of us who've been following it, it's basically the same info we already knew. And if you haven't been following it, I don't know how much you're actually going to glean unless right. you have a degree in, in neural, neural networks. networks. Sorry. All right. But then Elon came back on to talk about this. Yes. 
So yeah, that was a robot building another robot. And hanging out with other robots. And hanging out with other robots. Um, yeah, that was definitely not like real. It wasn't really building the robot. You could see it kind of struggling putting it in yeah. the thing. That's not the it, point. It was like a little it's marketing video. not the video. point of what this is. I mean, this is so far over the horizon here with Tesla, but it's amazing that they're actually working on this stuff. Yeah, and Elon was just talking about how much progress they've made since they even just unveiled you know, Optimus a few months ago. And Elon wrapped it up by saying, look, it's the least understood or appreciated part of what we do, but it's going to be worth more than the car side of things here at Tesla. And I could talk about this for another three hours, but we have another three hours of <laughs> presentation to cover. So we're going to try and do that and get, again and try and finish this in half an hour. So Rebecca Tanucci came on. She's in charge of charging. And I thought it was pretty cool. She had a lot of cool stats. I mean, in 2022, nine terawatt hours of charging. Over 50% of that was from home AC charging. They have 80,000 Tesla charging points. And Tesla's been working on superchargers for 10 years. They have the industry's lowest deployment costs, and they install and operate all their own supercharger sites. And they're working on what we've seen, which is pre-building the superchargers so they can just pretty much just drop them off. It's all plug and play. And the only problem is when they're trying to increase the site efficiency of a supercharger, that means more people charging at the same time. It means you might have a worse experience because it's crowded when they get there. So they're trying out some software to see if they can predict when superchargers will be busy so that they can almost like, I don't know, uh, minority report it. And in real time, they're able to um, tell people to go to basically different superchargers using route planning. This is one of the strengths of Tesla that I don't think I've even ever talked about. Um, Tesla not only has their own network of chargers, they also have their own thing that tells people where, which chargers to use so they can know when the charger's down and also if it's full. Also, I didn't know this, but I mean, it, there's been 30% quicker charge times just since 2018. And a lot of that has to do with uh, switching to version three superchargers, which, of course, can charge at 250 kilowatts. And now to the future of charging, as we know, in Europe, over 50 percent of Tesla superchargers are now open to non Teslas. There's now 10 sites in the U.S. as of the recording of this that have Magic Dock. And Magic Dock is a CCS adapter that lives in the supercharger. So if you drive up a non Tesla car, there's a good chance you can plug it in so long as it's not a leaf. And they're now building fourth generation superchargers in Europe that'll have longer charging cables. And that's the only difference. So don't get too excited. I want to take one second here. They they talked about, they put up this slide and didn't give any explanation for it. Now the picture on the left is of course the Tesla diner, which is going in in Hollywood. On the right though, um, what the f*** is that? <laughs> Zoom is, in, zoom in, is enhance. It, <laughs> What's that? Is it a is it a charger with batteries? Is it a bi directional charger? Uh, I is think it so. a high powered charger? Is yeah. Isn't it? Is it? It's an different. At home supercharger? I don't know. What is it? Yeah, we got to know. I want to know what it is. So put your comments down below. We need to know what it is. Next up was about supply chain. It's super important, but honestly, I mean, it's great. I don't want to take anything away from it, but yeah, it's it's tough, and, and they're it's good at supply it. Supply chain. <laughs> and the supply chain and they had it was it was tough and they were able to persevere everyone applause to the supply chain team but we're basically going to skip everything that they talked about oh but i do want to point out at the end of the presentation they said going from 0 to 40,000 cars a week was tough but going from 40,000 to 400,000 cars a week doesn't phase us and that's a quote so uh yeah that's what i like to hear all right, then we go to manufacturing, and this is Tom Zhu. He was the head of Tesla China, and we've reported on him a lot. He's a big player. He basically got Giga Shanghai up and running as fast as it did. Um, and they have over 65,000 manufacturing employees at Tesla, um, over 2 million parts a year that they make. And remember, they got Giga Shanghai up from a watermelon farm to a factory in nine and a half months. So Tom Zhu talked a lot about manufacturing, how they're trying to get you know all the manufacturing into a big, long, straight line. And it took Tesla 12 years to get the first 1 million cars out the door. It took them 18 months to get the second million, 11 months to get the third million, and only seven months to get the next million out the door. They just hit 4 million cars 4 tonight. 4 million cars tonight. Every 45 seconds, a car off the line. And they just had a new record at Fremont yesterday for output per employee. So this is two charts. We don't get any hard numbers here, but we get to see a relative between Shanghai on the left, Fremont on the right. The blue line is the Model Y output, and the white line is the labor hours. So always good if the labor hours are going down and the output's going up. Next up was manufacturing. We went back to Drew Baglino talking about cell manufacturing and talking about how they can reduce the factory footprint as they go to new cell technologies. As you can see there, that's the size of the factory shrinking. Um, 
area is hard to see shrink um, in quite the same way. And it's just really astounding that they're able to make a five times reduction. And then they talked about their Corpus Christi, Texas lithium refinery plant is going to take 10 months to build and then another 12 months to get production going. So they should be able to commission the building by the end of this year. And they're going to be using lots of cool technology. They're going to be taking in lithium spodumene mostly, um, although apparently they can take in almost any kind of lithium uh, feedstock. And this cathode factory should be making 60 gigawatt hours worth a year. Next up is Mike Snyder from the Energy Department, and he was showing all the cool projects they've built globally for the last 10 years. And they were talking about Megapax, uh, the 2XL, which is the largest, heaviest object you can transport without permits and without having to shut down roads. That's basically how they designed it. They're like, what's the biggest thing we can put on a truck where we don't have to like rip apart bridges? And that's where they got it. And just interesting here on the Megapack, um, two times more power dense than the typical gas peaker plant. And it connects to any grid right out of the box and it connects to other Megapacks right out of the box. They said they deliver more power electronics than the solar and wind industry combined. That's 1.4 terawatts deployed. Wow. Wow. And then they talked about the virtual machine mode from their um, Megapack. So basically we talked about this before. Um, it has this thing called virtual machine mode, which is basically a dampens the oscillations going on in the grid. And they were saying that grid operators who use this will not go back to anything else. In fact, one grid operator said they will not operate their grid without VMM anymore. And that is because when you fire up a traditional power plant, you get big turbines spinning and they go slower and faster and that oscillates the grid. And you have to try and time that to get it to be right. Whereas this is virtual, so they can do it with electronics to get it to be a nice, perfect you know, sine wave. They're talking about Lathrop, where they build the mega packs. They said they turned it from a JCPenney distribution center into the factory in less than 12 months. And they've been able to increase installation speed by 4x and reduce the cost and labor by 3x when they install these mega packs. And check this out. This is Tesla's AutoBidder, the AI software that helps them to buy and sell energy on the grid. If you were an Australian customer for their um, for electricity last year, $142 a month. But if you were a Tesla solar and Powerwall user, you could get $69 a month for your power. But if you allowed Tesla to use AutoBidder to buy and sell your electricity, they would pay you $61 a month. You would make money. And they talked about that they're rolling out this plan in Texas, which is starting in July, unlimited overnight home charging for $30 a month. Whoa, 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 whoa. So overnight, if, you if can- you've you got drive... a power, If you've got a power wall in Texas and you join this program, you can join this program. So you, you drive home from work, mm -hmm. you plug in your car. Mm -hmm. This would be like if you paid 30 bucks a month for gas, for as much gas as you wanted, yep. basically. Yeah, Texas is a big state. And they said, this is just the beginning. There's where we are, right there. We're right there. <laughs> That's why Elon has said many times the energy division could be bigger than the car division. Lori Shelby came out, talked about the Tesla team, 129,000 employees across the world. Half of them are in vehicle manufacturing and about half of them are in the U.S. 129,000 people work at Tesla? They got 3 million applications in 2021 for work. And as they pointed out, engineers want to work here. It's the number one and number two places that people want to work is SpaceX and Tesla. And it's just nice to talk about that in 2021, Tesla customers reduced 8.4 million metric tons of greenhouse gases, the equivalent to 8.7 million ICE vehicles off the road. So then we go back to financials and Zachary Kirkhorn came out and talked about that they continue to reduce the cost of our existing products. Model 3 from 2018 to 2022, 30% reduction in cost. And here's how they do it. Cost reductions come from everywhere. The next gen vehicle will enable a step change in cost and volume. A 50% target is what they're going for. 50% cost reduction from the current Model 3. And here's the total cost of ownership per mile over five years for a Toyota Corolla on the top, a Model 3 base model, and next-gen Tesla. <laughs> okay. And since 2018, they reduced OPEX, the operating expenses, and they've done this by constraining the number of programs that they work on. And when they do work on projects, they do them in parallel and they share the tech. This is completely different than Google. This is completely different than all the tech companies you hear of, where it's like there's some department somewhere and they're working on this thing that never needs to be implemented and nobody ever checks on them. Right. Tesla is completely different than this and that's why they're so efficient. So then Zachary talked about the fact that when they were going through production hell with the Model 3, they were also going through back office hell. And so as they're making, you know, 7,000 cars a week, they had to figure out how to get not just the factory workers to be able to do it, but how the back office had to do it. And one of the things you can see here is that Tesla is able to save 60 to 70 percent over the selling general and emission expenses per vehicle versus traditional automakers. This all happened during like 2018. This is yeah. all really recent stuff. But Tesla has their own 
operating system. Yeah, so all nine of these departments right now, and in fact, they just added their own uh, software for recruiting. They now make that software themselves. Only what they need, nothing more. So if you've ever worked at any company, you know that there's going to be some kind of... Um, software, right? That has to integrate into the company, but it doesn't integrate nicely into the company. So you need to pay someone to try and take a fairly general software and fit it into your company. Tesla does this the complete opposite way. They build their own operating system from the ground up. And that leads to this. Yeah. Continued improvement in internal process efficiency. Look at that. I mean, North American sales, 4X, document generation, 7X. Amazing. And then this one is pretty interesting. And so, so far they spent $28 billion. And here, a lot of people were like, whoa, wait, hang on. What's that on the left bottom? 150 to 175 billion is what they estimate will be the total investment needed to get to 20 million annual production for cars and one terawatt hour of annual energy production. That's interesting. The interesting part of this slide to me is the third box, reinvest to achieve unprecedented scale. Unprecedented. I like that. So then we had a five minute intermission so and we'll i wasn't see you in five minutes. five minutes later i was not looking forward to the q a because it was all basically it wasn't uh, retail investors like us it was all just the big institutions but elon did say as soon as they came back on stage that they announced gigafactory in mexico it'll be near monterey so nuevo leon which we have been telling you is we've think is the place it's going to go. And that is where it's going to go. Now, he stressed they are expanding total global output. So there's not like they're going to build a factory and then people are going to lose their jobs at other factories. No, they're going to be building all sorts of things at all the factories, including building the next gen vehicle in Mexico. But they're also going to build those next gen vehicles in other plants as well. He would not give a timeline for the next gen vehicle or basically when this plant is going to open. I don't think that timelines were necessarily what this event was about. This was about no. really long term stuff, not necessarily timeline, but more how the company functions and how they're able to do what they do so well. So did we get any one piece of big news? I guess you could say the Gigafactory in Mexico is that piece, um, but not really outside of that. What we did get was exactly what I think a lot of serious long-term investors wanted. We wanted real info right from the mouths of the leadership team. And that's what we got. We didn't get as much Elon this time, but we got a lot of Tesla. And I love pretty much every minute of it. I really liked being able to meet the team. And I want to say personally, hats off to Zachary Kirkhorn. Um, yeah, the CFO. The CFO of Tesla. I really do think that a lot of this is because of his vision for the company. They haven't done the typical um, Harvard Business School version of Tesla, which would not be anywhere close to this. They have been able to keep their profits really high, and they're about to reinvest all of that into making the most unstoppable company on earth. I like this because if you're an investor who's thinking about investing in this company, let's say you've never heard of them before, you got to see the entire team. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, those are all A-list people. I didn't see anyone there. Like if you go to like even GM or Ford, whatever, once you get past like the first couple people and they hand it off to the next VP and you're like, what, who's this guy? Um, you just get the sense that they're there for, I'm going to make it for two years and then I'm going to move up the rung and then I'm going to move over. Yeah. These people, so many of them have been there for 10 years or more and, and are really good at their job. They've transformed this company yeah. from something that was nothing into what it is today. And, and I also think this was a recruiting uh, video. I think of that course. you look there on stage and you see all different kinds of people from all different backgrounds. And it's just wonderful to see. They had such a great feeling of a team. Yeah. And uh, look at a lot of them. They're pretty darn young. Yeah. That's going to attract a lot of young engineers who I, I hate to be ageist. Right. But they're not going to have as many of the preconceptions that Tesla is really fighting against. Because, I mean, I, I want to put it to you like this. Zachary Kirkhorn has rewritten how a company should run. Mm. They have completely, completely obliterated how normal corporate structure works. And I mean, this to me was a four hour um, conference just devoted to showing that where it was just home run after home run after home run. Most of these things we don't ever really even get to see. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about like the powertrain efficiencies and how they build it. It's like, most of the time, that's not even something that the CEO knows about. Yeah. And here they are on stage talking about it. Um, Elon's able to field questions. He understands the whole game. So does the rest of the team. And it's really powerful to see that. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Comment down below what you think was the biggest part of the night. Also, maybe what you were disappointed in. I want to hear about it. We'll see you next time. Now, now you know. know.